Township, how are we? I have the pleasure to read the word of the Lord. Our reading for today is Genesis chapter 37, the whole of Genesis chapter 37, and the version that I'm reading is in NIV. Jacob moved in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks of his brother, the son of Bilhah and the son of Zilpah. His father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any other of them, they hated him and could not speak a word, kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and he told to his brothers they hated him all more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf burst and spilled out blood. While all your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His father said to him, do you attend to them over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. There he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his fathers as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I, your brothers, actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brother has gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brother are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brother and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he had sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I am looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing the flocks? They were moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them said, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph, so Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him, throw him into one of the cisterns, and then and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Who shed any blood? Throw, away, throw him away to the citrons here in the wilderness. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take this back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brother, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe that was wearing. And they took him and put him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, and with, there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat their meal. They looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh. And they were on the way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother and his own flesh and blood, his father agreed. So when the Midianite merchants come by, his, brother, his brothers pulled Joseph up of his cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites. They took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dripped the robe in his blood, in his blood. They took the ornate robes back to the father and said, we found this, examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. No, he said, 
I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept with him. Meanwhile, the Mennonites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. This is the word of the Lord. So this is a continuation of our series in the book of Genesis that I gave the title of this sermon. In our failures, God remains faithful. Let me begin with a question. Is there such a thing as a perfect family? A family that doesn't have any issues or problems or any sort of misunderstanding? A family that is perfect in every way. I reckon we all have the same answer, and that is no. For every family experiences challenges and problems of all sorts. And that is why the Bible gives us instructions about families and warnings as well. If we heed or take heart, God's instructions to us. As I go through chapter 37 of the book of Genesis, Genesis, I see a lot of mistakes and failures done by Jacob and his 12 sons. And this is not the type of families that anyone is dreaming of. Isn't, it is not the ideal family we want. It is a family full of hatred, a family full of resentment, jealousy, pride, envy, and betrayal as well. And sadly, it has always been that way since the fall of man. Adam and Eve never had a perfect family. Cain killed his brother Abel because of jealousy. Same as well with Noah who cursed his own son, Ham, for reporting to his brothers about his nakedness. Same as well with Sarah and Abraham, who longed to have a child, and Sarah got impatient and gave her servant, Hagar, to Abraham as a concubine. Same as well with, with, with Lot, Abraham's nephew. And Abraham's son, Isaac, and his wife, Rebekah, they had favorites. Jacob and Esau, which resulted to jealousy, hatred, and rivalry between the two. Now comes Jacob with his 12 sons. Yet Jacob has a favorite son, and that is Joseph. He loves Joseph more than his other brothers. And that is the reason why Joseph's brothers were jealous of him, and they hated him. And they wanted to kill him. In the latter chapters of the book of Genesis, we see Joseph as a man of faith, a man of integrity, a, a humble man, a forgiving man. Perhaps that's the Joseph that most of us think about, that he is perfectly a good person. However, friends, in chapter 37, I see a different Joseph. I see a 17-year-old a spoiled brat who gets most of the attention because his father loves him more than his other children. In verse 3 says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons. And this wasn't fair for his siblings. I see also Joseph as a fault finder that he reports bad things to his father about his brothers. In verse 2 it says, this is the account of Jacob. When Joseph was 17 years old, he was tending the flock with his brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpha, and he brought to their father a bad report about them. In Filipino we call it sombongero. Telling bad things to our parents. So 
That's the attitude that we see actually uh, in Joseph. I also see Joseph to be a bit arrogant and proud. Imagine for 17 years, he was the apple of the eye of his father. He was treated special than anybody else in the family. That's why his father gave him a special gift, a robe of many colors or a coat of many colors. He was treated like a prince. I tried to check on some of the commentaries. They say that the coat that was given to him was actually a, co a coat or a tunic not used by farmers or shepherds, but it is a tunic intended for kings. And that was how Joseph was treated. I see Joseph as someone who sees himself superior than his brothers. And that is why when he had these dreams, he was so excited to tell his brothers. In verses 6 to 10, he said to them, listen to this dream I had. In some versions of the Bible, it says, please listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out of the field when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said this to him, I, did you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. He knew how his brothers felt. They were upset with his first dream, and yet when he had this second dream, which is even more difficult to accept, again, he told, the, he told it to his brothers, and including his father as well, who was there. He has this sense or this sort of pride in him. He knew they were already pissed off with his first dream. Yet he shares his second dream. And that is why his father rebuked him. In verse 10, he says, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before me? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph was not a young boy anymore just like his brothers and his father he knew exactly the meaning of his dreams besides it was his gift his god-given gift to interpret dreams because others would say oh he's probably just a young boy he don't understand what he's doing but no he understood exactly the meaning of his dream and so he was so excited to tell them because he feels more privileged he feels more superior than his his brothers and what happened next is that they hated him so much they hated him so much and that is why in this chapter, everyone in Jacob's family made mistakes and failures. Just like anybody here. Me and you, we all make mistakes. Why? Because the Bible is clear. We are all sinners. And all the sad and hard experiences of Joseph was God's plan to make him a better person. The same as well with his brothers. All the struggles and hardships that his brothers went through was to make them realize their mistakes and their sins so that at the end, it is God who is glorified. So that at the end, it is the plans of God that would prevail. In the Holy Bible, we find many stories about failures of mankind. Stories about wickedness, immorality. And these things were written in a holy book. Why? Is it for us to be able to justify our wrongdoings? No. This is to show us a picture of the fallen and depraved state of humanity because of sin. 
Romans 3, 10 to 12 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together became worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. In short, we are all sinners. But just like the story of Joseph, there is hope in God. For there is no evil that can prevail over our faithful God. Joseph's brothers harbored sin in their hearts for so many years. Jealousy, hatred, envy, bitterness, rage. Friends, when we talk about these things, we talk about sin. And sin has the power to enslave us. Sin has the power to enslave people. If we embrace sin, it would forge its way ahead. It will take the lead. It will become our master. That is why Jesus said in John 8, 34, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So as well with Peter, when he talks about the ungodly in 2 Peter 2, 19, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For p- people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. And this is the reason why Joseph's brothers sinned all the more. From one sin to another and then to another. Sin can grow and it gives birth to death. That's what the book of James say in chapter 1 verse 15. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And that's why in Romans 3, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph's brothers thought that they had won. That they were able to get rid of of their much-hated sibling. But notice how sin grew and progress in their hearts and minds. From jealousy and envy to hatred. From hatred to rage. From rage to conspiracy to kill him. Sin grew so big. But this, this did not hinder the plan of God. In their lives. Why? Because no evil will prevail against the plan of our sovereign God. Joseph's sentence was lowered. His brothers agreed to sell him for 20 pieces of silver. This reminds me of our history in the Philippines in 1889 when. Spain actually sold the Philippines to America, not for 20 pieces of silver, but for $20 million. And that's the time when the Americans came and occupied the Philippines again. After that came the Japanese. So after selling their brother to slavery, Joseph's brothers made more and more mistakes. As I said earlier, what did they do? They planned to cover up what they did. They made up a story to tell their father. In verses 31 to 33, it says, Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. To see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured it. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. They lied. And their lies broke the heart of their father. Inflicting in him pain and sorrow. And no one among his sons and daughters were able to comfort him. In verse 35, it says, All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, 
I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. So sad because not even one of his children dare or was willing to confess the truth. They were looking at their father in pain and in agony. But no one dared to tell him the truth. That is what sin can do. It can take control over our minds and our hearts. And it would mess up even our lives. Life may not always be fair. But to resort to sin is not the right response. It wasn't fair that Joseph was the favored child. Jacob should have known about this because he was in rivalry with his brother Esau because of favoritism. But we can't control the fact that life isn't fair. We can only control the way we respond to the realities of this world. Remember, even the family of our Lord Jesus wasn't perfect. Jesus' brothers didn't like him. Jesus was even closer to his disciples than to his family. In John chapter 7, verse 3 to 5, it says here, Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure act in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5 says, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Our life, friends, is an open book before God. He knows us from cover to cover. He knows all our failures and our mistakes. And nothing is hidden from him. We may not understand why things are the way they are. We would sometimes question God. Where is God when life is unfair? Why are these things happening to me? I don't know. But perhaps there are things that God wants us to learn. Just like Joseph and his brothers. In Psalms chapter 119 verses 75 to 76 it says. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. God, based in this verse, God is faithful to afflict us if necessary or when necessary. He is faithful to discipline us when necessary. But during the times of affliction, friends, God's steadfast love will never fail to comfort us. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. In our life as a Christian, how many times did we fail? And in those failures, how did we respond from the age of 18, I, stooped, I stepped my foot into ministry. I will be 50 this year. For 30 years that I've been serving the Lord. And during those years, I made wrong decisions. I know I failed God many times. And many times I cried out to the Lord. I poured myself to the Lord. And the reason why I am still serving the Lord until now is all because of His grace and because of His faithfulness. I remember what Charles Spurgeon, known to be the Prince of Preachers, he said, the glory of God's faithfulness is that no sin in our, of ours has ever made Him unfaithful. No sin of ours has ever made God unfaithful. 
I do not know your failures. I don't know your challenges. But one thing I know for sure, friends, the God who called us is faithful. And I will end this message in first, with a verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. It says here, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. One who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your love and for your faithfulness. Yes, indeed, Lord, you know us from cover to cover. There are times that we fail you and we fail other people. But knowing who you are and knowing your attributes, oh God, you are the God who loves us, that you are the God of second chance, oh Lord, that you would always open up your arms to welcome us whenever we come near to you. Father, you know the hearts and minds of your people. I pray, Lord God, that if anybody, Lord God, is going through trials or depression or any sort of evil thing, Lord God, I pray that your love will comfort them and that you will remind them always of your word that you are the faithful, the loving, the caring God that we serve. In your name we pray. Amen. In our failure,